Okay. Um, so we're continuing with our uh, Dogen study text. And uh, last Saturday, I think that the majority of you were with us last time. We had um, a wonderful talk from Ryotan Roshi and Damondo and some wonderful comments uh, from people based on their experience with the exercise. And uh, I wanted to note here at the start that um, the, this Dharma talk is going to be recorded, uh, Musho informs me, but the Mondo and other parts of the workshop will not be recorded and circulated. So everyone should feel free to speak from the heart during the workshop. And uh, we are nearing the uh, end of our second week of Ongo, uh, online Ongo practice, a second of three weeks. And I, um, I feel like uh, this has been a, a quite a different experience from our usual uh, residential in-person um, Ongo. Um, and I've gotten the sense that others too have been uh, experiencing it differently. Um, the heat doesn't seem all that different, but uh, in other ways there, there do seem like uh, big differences. I, I know um, in my own case, I'm um, going about my household affairs with my partner um, in the same apartment. I'm having to attend to work matters, some external communications. Um, things that wouldn't be happening during our regular residential retreat. And I also find that uh, I find myself very distracted a lot of the time. Uh, there isn't so much of those occasional moments on in residential retreat, maybe in the early morning sitting or the late night sitting when things really settle down and get very quiet and very still. So the question arises, is this uh, ongo, uh, this online virtual ongo, um, something less than a real ongo experience, a pale reflection of real practice? Is it a painting of a rice cake, whereas the past experience was the real thing, the real rice cake? And I think that Dogen's study text helps us uh, with this. It helps us to take seriously, take seriously this online retreat as a painted rice cake, but also to see that our residential retreats that we um, remember in the past and maybe idealize are also painted rice cakes. Getting back to the text, in Dogen's fascicles, it's quite um, usual for him to start out with a, at the head of the text with a statement that really sums up the teaching of, of the whole fascicle. And um, he does that with Gabbio, with this painted rice cake fascicle. Um, and we'll come back to that first section, but. I think that the real starting point for Dogen in this text is actually the second section. And that is when he explores this, this saying, painted rice cakes do not satisfy hunger. So uh, that hunger is, um, I mean, this is a, a very old expression in Zen. It's one that you still hear today. Um, the hunger can refer to that, um, that yearning that we have that brings us to practice in the first place. Uh, some way that we're looking for to resolve our existential conflicts or to find some release from our suffering or the agitation of our mind. It, it can refer to our hunger for enlightenment, our hunger to get to the bottom of things. And, uh, Ryotan gave us the story last time of Master Kyogen, with whom this saying is identified. Uh, he was a, a very brilliant um, 
student uh, who had a, a great mastery of the sutras, but at a certain point he realized that all of his learning really hadn't done the trick for him. There was still something missing and he had to set all of that aside um, to, uh, to really satisfy that hunger. And so normally when we talk about that, it, it refers to turning the light inward, turning away from external references, turning the light inward and really working with our own karma and working with our own minds. And so uh, normally the saying painted rice cakes not satisfy hunger is a, a statement about how sutras, Buddhist sutras and commentaries and all the extensive literature are uh, really secondary to the primary experience and the primary field of, of our turning the light inward and, and practicing intimately. So it means that it, the expedient means, the devices uh, that past teachers have used are really, um, don't, don't get to the heart of the matter. It's like uh, saying painted rice cakes do not satisfy hunger is like saying you can't scratch your foot with your shoe on. Or it's like reading the menu in a restaurant, even if the menu has lots of pictures of all the dishes, reading the menu won't fill our stomach. And this goes along with a fundamental teaching um, in the Zen uh, tradition, which is that the Dharma is passed on through face-to-face -face transmission outside of words and letters. So supposedly Bodhidharma said, referred to a special transmission outside the scriptures, not depending on words and letters, directly pointing to the mind, seeing into one's true nature and attaining Buddhahood. And uh, this idea uh, about um, what is outside words and letters is something that Dogen also uses in some of his uh, teachings. So if we look, for example, at uh, the Shobo Genzo Zuimongi, which are his recorded sayings to his monks um, in the monastery, these are informal little talks that he gave that were written down by one of his disciples. Um, for example, Dogen's, um, I'll give you, give you a, an instance of this. Uh, one day Dogen instructed, once while in China, I was reading a collection of sayings by an ancient master. At the time, a monk from Shisen or Sichuan, a sincere practitioner of the way asked me, what is the use of reading recorded sayings? I replied, I want to learn about the deeds of the ancient masters. The monk asked, and what is the use of that? I said, I wish to teach people after I return home. The monk asked, and what is the use of that? I replied, it is for the sake of benefiting living beings. The monk queried further, yes, but ultimately, what is the use? Later, I pondered his remarks. Learning the deeds of the ancient masters by reading the recorded sayings or koans in order to explain them to deluded people is ultimately of no use to my own practice and for teaching others. Even if I don't know a single letter, I will be able to show it to others in inexhaustible ways if I devote myself to just sitting and clarifying the great matter. It was for this reason that the monk pressed me as to the ultimate use of reading and studying. I thought what he said was true. Thereupon, I gave up reading the recorded sayings and other texts, concentrated wholeheartedly on sitting, and was able to clarify the great matter. So it's funny to think of Dogen recommending to his monks that they give up uh, words and letters when uh, uh, he's giving them Dharma talks, he's writing fascicles uh, for them. 
and he's um, passing these on to, to others. There, aren't, there weren't a lot of um, teachers like Dogen who were writing their teachings down for posterity. Um, so, but I think that uh, while Do Dogen does hold this line sometimes about not depending on words and letters, he is never, uh, he never wants to get stuck in a one-sided view of things. So his, his writings are constantly upending our familiar views about things and trying to help us to think and act more freely. So Dogen uh, realizes that the conventional perspective on a painted rice cake doesn't satisfy hunger is actually a problematic one. Um, it's problematic because it's ultimately dualistic. There is a thing called reality, and then there's a representation of reality that points to reality. There is a thing called reality, and then there's a pale reflection of it, uh, which would be uh, words and letters. Uh, they are illusions about reality. So what he's trying to do in this fascicle, which is so uh, in some ways mind bending, is to really interrogate and break down that dualism using words and letters. But Dogen is not only talking about expedient means and the sutras and um, fascicles like this one. He's also talking about our tendency to fall into dualism in our life in all sorts of other ways and to fall into dualism in our practice, which we do whenever we set up the idea of a difference between Buddha on the one hand and me on the other, between enlightenment and delusion, the sacred and the ordinary. And so Dogen tells us in the text, do not doubt it with the limited view that separates ordinary from sacred. So he's, he's trying to convey the sense that our own life is in fact a manifestation of reality and not a pale reflection of it, a virtual reality. Our own construction of reality is a manifestation of reality how we think about reality and our very illusions are a manifestation of reality. How we paint reality, to use the metaphor from this text, how we paint reality is itself a manifestation of reality. How we translate reality is a manifestation of reality. How we perform reality is a manifestation of reality. So that ultimately nothing can be left out from reality or from your life. Not even the way we create duality with our minds can be left outside of reality. So I think that uh, in this way Dogen is moving from a more narrow view, a kind of a critique of the idea that reality is outside words and letters. He's moving towards a, a statement about the very nature of all phenomena, including our life. And that's what he's sharing with us in the opening to the fascicle in at the very beginning, even before he gets into the painted rice cake section. So in that first section, um, He's, he's giving us a, a, a painted rice cake, um, which is uh, pointing beyond the normal dualities that we construct. So he says, all Buddhas are realization, thus all things, all things are realization. Yet no Buddhas or things have the same characteristics. None have the same mind. Although there are no identical characteristics or minds, at the moment of your actualization, numerous actualizations manifest without hindrance. At the moment of your manifestation, numerous manifestations come forth without touching one another. 
So what's he talking about here? Um, I thought of an example. Uh, he's speaking in fairly abstract terms, but if we put, want to put a concrete example uh, before us. Um, I don't know, uh, I imagine many of you have seen um, uh, either in person or seen pictures of the architecture in ancient Buddhist temples in Asia. Uh, typically in, within a temple, there is a central image of the Buddha, like a statue. And then that uh, statue is surrounded on all the walls by an infinite number of small representations of the Buddhas, typically in small niches, uh, some of them just a few inches tall. And within each of those niches, a different Buddha is sculpted. And these walls um, go on endlessly. So I'm going to see if I can give you a, uh, share an image with you of this. Can you see this? Okay, great. So these are, this is a, a, a cave in a Buddhist temple in China, ancient from the fifth century. And you can see all along the walls, there are different niches with Buddha. Some of them are larger. Uh, some of them are medium size, some of them are very small, and it's an endless, endless panoply of Buddhas. So uh, if you think of that, um, and then compare that to the Zoom painting, or the Zoom architecture that you have right in front of you, I think that they have something in common. If you look on the screen in front of you, every window is unique and distinct from every other on all the screens. One niche does not interfere with the others. One Dharma one phenomenon does not obliterate the others when it manifests. Each is whole unto itself and at the same time, together they compose a whole ensemble and that whole ensemble is composed of each of them. Dogen says, at the moment of your manifestation, numerous manifestations come forth without touching one another. Now, it depends whether you're in gallery view or in speaker view. Is gallery view or speaker view the real view? Or is neither the real view? I think that in, in our ordinary daily lives, we tend to get trapped in the narrow speaker view where we are the speaker or maybe the person in front of you is the speaker. And we tend to lose the gallery view. But then maybe uh, once in a while, we do gain a sense of the whole gallery if we can drop for a moment the ordinary narrow speaker view. And then it's also possible to get lost in that broader gallery view and forget to appreciate the fullness of each individual niche. So we can't attach either to the gallery view or to the speaker view as being the right option. And so Dogen is telling us ultimately, do not take oneness or difference as the criterion of our study. So last time during the Mondo, there was a question uh, someone asked about why this metaphor of the painting? Uh, what about another metaphor? Does it have something to do with vision? And I think that we can take any number of metaphors really for what Dogen is talking about. I mean, the painting metaphor is, is especially elegant, but uh, there are any number of others we could take. And so, um, for example, um, 
how often have we heard that the heart of Zen practice is Zazen? The heart of Zen practice is not Dharma talks and study workshops and ceremonies and rituals. These are just toys. Give yourself over to wholehearted sitting. That's the spirit of a lot of Soto Zen teaching and of Dogen's own teaching. Dogen himself said, Zazen is the principal gate. The others are secondary. But at the same time, Dogen doesn't let us get away with a one-sided view. And he pushes us to confront the seamlessness of reality so that all of reality is actually a sutra. All of reality is a Dharma talk. All of reality is a study workshop. All of reality is a ceremony. So we could take another metaphor and say all of your life is a ceremony. All of your life is a ritual performance. Just as you perform Zazen, you perform Dogen study right now. Just as you perform chanting, bowing in the Zendo, you perform rising from bed, rising from bed in the morning, making your bed, brushing your teeth, making your coffee, um, performing all your ordinary humdrum activities is no different from chanting or bowing in the Zendo. I think that if, if we really engage with ritual in the Zen context, we can learn a lot from it. And it can help us to break down that dichotomy we, me, we tend to construct between ordinary life and sacred life. So again, Dogen says, do not doubt it with the limited view that separates ordinary from sacred. From this perspective, we are always performing the ceremony of our life. There is actually no difference between reality and our performance. Now, during this uh, virtual ongo, uh, we're carrying out our daily life in our apartments and our homes uh, when we're not sitting or attending a workshop. And this is no less how we manifest and how we paint and how we perform the ceremony of our lives. How you are responding to the profound crisis of our time is also how you perform the ceremony of your life. As a friend falls sick and you carry them in your heart, you perform the ceremony of your life. As a family member dies and your heart breaks, you perform the ceremony of your life. And this manifestation and painting and ceremonial performance go on and on without end. Dynamically shaped by causes and conditions like the crisis or like Ango and dynamically shaping the causes and conditions like the crisis or Ango. Right now, you are performing, you are creating, you are painting uh, Buddha. You're creating the, the performance of a Buddha, of a human, of you yourself, in which the gallery view and the speaker view are both true, although you can't attach to either of them. The large view includes the small niche and the small niche opens up onto the large temple. At the end of his fascicle, Dogen writes, when you understand this teaching with your body and mind, you will thoroughly experience the ability to turn things and be turned by things. If this is not done, the power of the study of the way is not yet realized. To enact this ability is to actualize the painting of enlightenment. And this is the part that we looked at last time. How do you turn things and how are you turned by things? How do you paint things and how are you painted? And this phrase about being turned by things and turning things uh, actually comes from 
an old painted rice cake in Buddhism, which is the Surangama Sutra. And the Surangama Sutra says, living beings from beginningless time have all been deluded by things. They lose their original mind due to being turned by things. Therefore, they see here the large and they see the small. If they could turn the things, they would be the same as a Tathagata, a Buddha. Their bodies and minds would be perfect and bright. Without moving from the place of awakening, in the tip of a single hair, they could fully include the lands of the ten directions. So we are all turned by things all the time. And when we engage in practice, we also turn things. And how do we do that? Well, first of all, we do it simply by staying awake, staying present right now in the midst of our life, whatever challenges we face, turned by our thoughts, but not swept away by them. We do it by not creating a separation between our life and all things a separation between the real and the virtual, the real and the illusory, the Tathagata and me, or not attaching to those, uh, to those dichotomies. Or rather, uh, we could say that we do it by seeing that we are constantly creating those separations in our minds and are constantly turned by our thoughts. And then we do it by responding to the conditions in our life with that same presence of mind and with all the resources that we have at hand, including the teachings, the precepts, uh, on-go activities, the painted rice cake fascicle. I think that what stands out in this last final passage in the Dogen's text is, is an emphasis on our ability. He says, uh, you will thoroughly experience the ability to turn things and be turned by things. To enact this ability is to actualize the pain of enlightenment. It's an ability that each one of us has, but that we have to manifest. We have to enact, we have to perform to be the same as the Tathagata, it has to be practiced. This ability is available to us right now, to each one of us in our unique niches, in our own virtual retreats, in our own paintings, in our own performances, and as part of the great gallery of being. Thank you. <laughs>